Hello, everybody, and welcome to Limited Level Ups. I'm Alex, and this week's episode is our Lord of the Rings gameplay level up episode. The last few weeks, we've been focusing on drafting, deck building, and now it's time to turn to arguably the most important aspect of drafting after a few weeks of the format, honing your gameplay skills. So if you haven't joined us for one of these types of episodes before, the way I like to go about them is we start off with just general gameplay tips, just big picture ideas to kind of frame the format, how to best play out the games. Then we move into talking about individual cards, best practices for playing with cards, how to play against cards, uh, maybe a few interesting interactions along the way. And in general, the goal for this episode is just to hopefully point out some mistakes that you might not even know that you're making. The format is quite deep as far as gameplay goes, so buckle up, we got a jam-packed episode today. And of course, just before I jump in, I do want to shout out the Patreon, patreon.com slash limited level ups. That is the number one place that you can go to support the podcast or any of my content, if you like the streams, the articles, the the whatever it is, go check that out, patreon.com slash limited level ups. And pertinent to this episode, the Patreon has a lot of great ways for you to get better at gameplay, whether that be the coaching tier or there's the gameplay review tier where you can send me a, a draft log or a gameplay log of any game you want. I'll give you a quick, you know, five, 10 minute video talking about the key decisions, talking about anything that I would have done differently. Great way to quickly level up your game. You could also check out the Discord, the Limited Level Ups Discord, bits.ly slash join the Discord. A lot of very eager and helpful people over there that will be willing to take a look at your gameplay logs as well. And it's a free Discord. Anybody can join. Check out that link, and the link will also be in the show notes of the podcast and the description of the YouTube video. All right, let's jump in. So the first thing that I want to touch on is something that I'm looking to make somewhat of a staple of these gameplay episodes, and it's a segment I'm calling What's in a Game? And essentially, the idea with this segment is I want to provide a framework or a blueprint or a sort of model for how games generally play out in this format. Games in any format, any limited format, any constructed format, doesn't really matter. They tend to have a certain flow to them, right? There are common inflection points in each game that happen game in, game out. Play patterns, if you will, that you'll pick up on if you play a format a lot. And I think understanding that flow of how games unfold and generally what your objectives should be turn to turn not only is going to provide a lot of context for a lot of the ideas that we're going to talk about today but if you understand the flow of the game and your incentives on um, you know turn to turn just or just as a game in the game as a whole you're going to get a lot better predicting what's going to happen on each turn and on future turns and how that affects your current turn and what your opponents are likely to play on future turns. It's almost like a sixth sense, honestly, that you develop after you play a format for a long time. When you understand a format at this level, that's what lets you compete to the best of your ability, right? Without having that understanding of how the games play out generally, you're just not going to be making the best decisions. It's almost like if you jumped into a draft without knowing what the good cards are. And you know, you can do okay just kind of stumbling around in the dark with educated guesses on what the best cards are or in the gameplay scenario, like yeah, how I'm supposed to play at this game, how the games generally play out. But the people who have a deep understanding of this model or this framework of how games in a given format play out, they're gonna outplay you. I'm sure you've played against somebody in your lifetime in some format or maybe in many formats where you just felt like they almost knew what you were going to do next. And you're like, okay, I'm gonna do this and they perfectly play around it. And it's like, well, how, how did they know that was going to happen? Well, they have a good mental model of how the games play out. And they were able to, with some reliability, predict what you might have done. And of course, the purpose of this podcast, of Limited Level Ups in general, is partially so that I can try to relay to you what I've learned playing out 700 games of this format. So you don't have to play those 700 games to get to those conclusions. I can just give you a bit of a shortcut to that. So... I'm hoping that this episode is going to shine a bit of a light on those folks that, you know, don't average close to as many games as I do or some other players do, but also for those players that might be playing a lot a ton and the format just hasn't clicked with them completely yet. You know, that's generally when I feel like a format clicks for me. Th that's kind of what I mean in the gameplay. I, I can start to predict what my opponents are doing. I know exactly on each turn what I'm supposed to play. And this is a format, by the way, that is very difficult. Like it took me... I would say about a week longer than it does for most formats to really get to that clicking point. Just to put a button on this idea and how important I think it is to understand this kind of flow of the game, a few times a month, you know, maybe once or twice a month, I will play constructed, like in preparation for a constructed tournament, usually the weekend qualifiers on Arena. And to prepare for these events, I spend about a week picking my deck and playing out the deck I eventually choose to play. And I would say in that week, I get to play 
you know, maybe about 100 games or 100 matches. And I don't think that's enough. Like, I, I'm basically preparing under what I think is the right amount to do because I'd rather spend my time playing limited, <laughs> to be honest. And uh, the reason I say that is because I can play my deck a lot of times and I can feel generally comfortable with how my cards play. And then when I actually get into the games, I feel a little bit uncomfortable because that sense I have in limited of, oh, I know what's going to happen on this turn. I, I know what my opponent is likely to do. I know there's like three cards here that they could have with this mana on this turn. I don't have that sense instilled in me as much as I would like to. And I really do feel it playing out in these constructed tournaments. So <laughs> my goal, again, once again today, is to instill you with that confidence of what's going to happen turn to turn, or at least the general broad overview of how the games play out so you do kind of have a better idea and you're not just fumbling around in the dark trying to play your game. And so a lot of what we're going to get into today comes from a bit of a personal journey uh, I've had with playing this format. Like I mentioned a second ago, I did struggle to have this format click for me for a while and after I did some gameplay log review for myself, really questioned what I felt was true about this set, I uncovered a lot of things that I figured out I was doing wrong and many of the points I'm going to outline do come from mistakes I made a few weeks ago and then how I fixed them. So let's get into it. How do games in this set generally play out? Almost every deck in this format is trying to be, and I would go as far as to say they, they should try to be, a proactive deck. Control decks in this format have a really tough time with guaranteeing inevitability. Um, and that's because of the ring mechanic. The idea generally with control decks in limited is that as you start to play more expensive cards, you'll start to outclass what your aggro opponent is doing. You'll use removal spells on key threats like on flyers or, you know, they're good on commons. But since this is limited and you generally don't have field wipes, sweepers, or just like 20 removal spells, you do have to rely on blockers to some degree to blank your opponent's cheap creatures, right? You have a 3-3 three, three in play, that virtually deals with all their 2-2s. But this control plan, of course, doesn't really work that well in this format because of the ring mechanic. With enough tempt cards, your opponent will eventually be able to turn their 1-1 one -one into a real threat that starts to loot away cards, starts to get past your blockers, starts to eventually deal you 4 damage when they get to that last ability of the ring. And by the way, that looting ability, that's a big thing too, because a lot of the way that a control deck outclasses an aggro deck in general is their cards are just better. The control deck's cards are objectively better, or at least they have more good expensive cards, and they're relying on the, the aggro deck to draw a few lands in the late game. Well, if they're not going to draw lands and those get converted into spells, that's that's a really big deal. But anyways, you know, you only have so many removal spells that you can point at important creatures, and when all of these small little one ones, like, you know, just like a haunt of the dead marshes, eventually becomes a threat, that's a pretty bad spot to be in as the control deck, because your removal will be taxed more often in this format than it will be in others because you have to kill like almost everything. And since you're relying on your blockers to some degree to keep you alive and they'll stop being effective at some point, well, you got a problem. And this was a big learning point for me, actually. I was trying to draft decks at the beginning of this format that weren't even like hard control decks, but decks that had a bunch of cheap interaction and had a bunch of card draw. And I was hoping just to out card and outclass my opponents eventually, right? And it took me a while to realize that that's not a very good strategy. With some exceptions, I will say, I do know that Sam Black and Ben from Lords Limited have had good success with decks that like loop the bath song and just try to draw their whole deck. So this isn't to say that control is impossible, but I do think you are inherently disadvantaged if you are trying to go into the draft and draft a reactive deck. And for a reactive deck to be successful, not only does your card quality have to be quite high, you kind of have to get past or open the right cards, but it also takes some know-how to draft these controlling decks to know the exact balance of the types of cards that make these decks viable. You know, Sam Black is a player who kind of, that, that's kind of his jam, and, and in this format it's been Ben's jam too, so they've had a lot of practice, but I think for most people, they're not going to have that know-how, and of course, they're also going to know, the, you know, Ben and Sam and those people that are uh, privy to drafting these Bath Song decks, they're going to know when that lane is open. They're like, okay, I'm seeing the cards I need to see, and that can lead to some success with a deck that is kind of fighting against the grain of what this format is asking of you. So I won't be talking too much about these super late game control decks because I think they are a very, very small sliver of this format. And the vast majority of the, the decks in this format should try to be proactive to avoid running into an opponent who just has 
a bunch of tempt cards in their aggro deck, and their aggro deck does actually have more inevitability than your control deck does. Even decks like Blue Black, which you might describe as, you know, kind of a controlling deck, isn't the kind of control deck that tries to grind you out of resources and just win eventually. It's They're more trying to, like, play some early interaction, uh, play some creatures early, maybe even be kind of aggressive, to be honest, and then not that late in the game, you know, turn five, turn six, they'll start to try to turn the corner. They'll play their Mouth of Sauron, or they'll have a bunch of tempt cards, and they'll be able to um, capitalize on some of the early chip damage that their creatures dealt. The more controlling archetypes in this format are still trying to turn the corner quite quickly as the game goes on, and they're, they're looking to play, like, an eight-turn game and not a 12-turn game, you know what I mean? And so when you have a format where the vast majority of decks are trying to be proactive, and those decks are punished, like actually punished, if they have to take the defensive role, because again, the ring bear mechanic punishes trying to play a long game, the way you should frame the games in this format, and if you take away anything from this episode, let it be this. Your main objective in most games is to fight for the beatdown role. You want to set yourself up to be the one who puts your opponent on the back foot and punishes them by forcing them to take the defensive role. And that's key too, force them to take the defensive role. If you can do that, if you can force them to take the defensive role, it's almost like you get to swap out your opponent's deck for a worse deck, right? One of those kind of controlling decks that I was talking about that are, are generally disadvantaged in this format. You force them to take the defensive role, and of course that advantages you because you can start to take advantage of the ring. You know, you've, you've been aggressive early, you've got them down to 12, and the ring's really going to be threatening to them because all this you know, small chip damage and once you get to that fourth ability is a real problem. But also, you make it very difficult for your opponent to use the ring, because if they have to be defensive, then attacking to use the ring ability is very much not what they want to do, right? The ring is an aggressive mechanic, and if you put your opponent in a spot where they aren't allowed to attack, it just makes all their tempt cards a little bit worse. And some of my early losses in this format, when I went back and analyzed my games, I was sort of confused for a while, because when I was, you know, maybe not even playing a controlling deck, but had a more reactive hand and more of a mid-range or aggressive deck, you know, maybe it had like a smite, the, the two mana deal three on turn two, maybe another removal spell on turn three. And I, I was keeping pace or it looked like I was keeping pace with my opponent, but I was still getting run over eventually, getting put in spots where I didn't want to get put in, even though they played a two. I answered it. They played a three. I answered that. And I was losing all those games. And I was thinking, what, what, what's happening here? Why is that happening? And of course, the reason I was losing those games is because I wasn't giving myself the opportunity to take the beatdown roll, right? I just kind of assumed that if I had a hand of, you know, a few cheap interaction spells and maybe a good four and a good five, that was good enough uh, to, to close the game. And my expensive cards will eventually take over, right? But those games would have played a lot better for me if I played a attacking two drop on two, followed by a good three drop, and I allowed myself, I set myself up to pressure so that I could use the ring to its fullest and force my opponent into spots where they couldn't use the ring, they needed to block, and eventually they would die to the ring. And that's really the difference maker, right? If this format revolves so much around tempting in the ring like we know it does, it's so much better to get off to an early start, put your opponent to 12, and even if they start to stabilize, you're like, I don't care, you're at 12, you're gonna die to this ring eventually, unless you have something, you know, awesome, and I'm not saying it's impossible to stabilize, but I'm sure you felt in this format, it is pretty difficult to stabilize if you've already taken that first 10 points of damage. So to be able to comfortably and reliably take that beat down roll, you want to put cards in your deck that allow you to do so. Obviously, a bunch of twos, a bunch of threes, a bunch of ones, that's ideal. You want to be able to make sure that your opening hand has a good number of creatures, so you don't miss out on that opportunity to take that beat down roll. A really good example of a card that excels in this role is Rally at the Hornburg. And a lot of people have asked me over the past few weeks, why is Rally at the Hornburg, which by the way, when a red sorcery create two 1-1 one, one human soldier tokens and your humans gain haste until on a turn, why is this card so good? Why is it a top common in the format? Why is it so much better than this kind of card usually is? Is giving haste that much better than not having haste? The answer is yes, <laughs> basically. When you cast this card on turn two and you attack your opponent and you put them to 18, you already got that train rolling, right? It feels like your, your opponent feels like they're already behind. They're like, oh, well, I've already started the game off at 18, not 20. And that's already a nudge in the direction of, hey, the person who cast that rally, they're already putting a vote in for, yeah, I'm the beatdown and you're not. And multiple rallies, of course, plays very well together because they just kind of compound and 
being able to go wide means you can just keep attacking, attacking, attacking. Maybe you lose one thing a turn, but that's not a huge deal. You've already gotten that early chip damage. You're dealing more chip damage. And of course, eventually, ideally, if your deck is built this way, those tokens will start to wear the ring and start to get in. So that early chip damage you got in really does matter. Another good example is March of the Black Gate. This is the one of the black uncommon enchantment that when it enters the battlefield or when an army you control attacks, you amass orcs one. This card, you know, whenever you face this, you immediately go, I need to kill that thing. I'm terrified of that. And it immediately forces your opponent into the defensive position where they might have, you know, if you play just a, a two mana two, two, they kind of go, okay, you know what? I can attack. I'll, I'll still try to wrangle that beat down roll into my hands but your opponent plays a march and it's just like you you can't not try to defend against it you either have to cast a removal spell and that means you're not developing your own board or you have to try to double block which you know has <laughs> its own problems because otherwise if you just let the march token go unchecked uh your opponent's just gonna snowball and they're just gonna start winning and forcing your opponent to have to defend there it, it all adds up it's all tied together because if you force them to defend means they can't add to their board means they don't have maybe they, they use a removal spell on your march token it means that they don't have that removal spell to then push damage of their own in the later part of the game so it really when you're trying to take that beat down roll it's all about that snowballing advantage and forcing your opponent to not snowball and then you have a few cards in the set that not only help you take that beat down roll but prevent your opponent from taking that beat down roll so cards like easterling vanguard this is the one in a black two one that when it dies you amass one Protector of Gondor, the four mana, three, three, that when it ETVs, you make a one, one human soldier token. Dunlin Crabane, of course, everybody knows this one, the one, one flyer that masses two. All these cards make your opponent kind of stop in their tracks, right? They go, all right, well, I could attack, but then I trade off, you know, I attack my two, two into their Crabane and they trade off the two, two and, you know, they're left with a, a one, one flyer. That's not a very good exchange for me. Or with the Vanguard, you play the Vanguard two, they play a two drop. Let's say they were on the play. They go, I don't really want to attack into the Vanguard. Projector Gondor, same thing. It allows you to stabilize. And then, you know, you can turn the corner. You've got uh, four power worth of stats for four mana. That's pretty good. So any of these kind of cards. And Rally, by the way, Rally does this too. Rally at the Hornburg. You know, you get this, the classic example of your opponent plays a 2-1 on turn two. You play a Rally. You attack with the one token. You leave one token back. Well, you you start to peck in. They don't want to block that 1-1. One, one. And then the 2-1 can't really attack. And what I would recommend, actually, what I've started to do I've started to make bad trades, honestly. I, I will trade my 2-1 for their 1-1 one, one rally token because it feels bad on value, right? You're like, oh man, like I, I'm trading half a card for my card. But time and time again, I just really regret not taking that trade down, not trading my full card for their half a card because when it comes down to it, this format's not really about grinding out resources. It is mostly about who can take that beat down roll and slowing down your opponent's ability to take that beat down roll if you're not in an immediate position to take that beat down roll and i'm not saying you should continually go trade my card for half your card trade my card for half your card but i'm just saying it's okay to do it once or twice and plus there's going to be some cards like these cards i'm mentioning protector of gondor dunlin crabane easterling vanguard that you can kind of do that back to your opponent your opponent's going to be forced to be in spots where they take kind of not great trades Essentially, what I'm saying here is your life total is really important. It's important to keep it high. Don't take chip damage because then your opponent can put you in a really bad spot. Another way to put this in an observation that I had made for myself going back and reviewing my games is I think this is the format that I chump block and chump attack more than any other format. And you're going to see that an example of that in a second. But basically, the idea is, you know, I throw my 1-1s in front of my opponent's creatures when I'm at 15, a, a decent amount of the time. If my hand, I feel like, okay, I need just a little more time. Just, you know, you don't want to get into that danger zone of like 12, 11, 10 too early. And conversely, I am willing to trump attack to put my opponent in that danger zone, attack with a bunch of stuff, put them down to 10, and then have the ring carry me to victory from there. And a small aside, I think... I think this is part of why green and to a lesser extent white actually struggles in this format because those colors are not that good at forcing your opponent to block early like green green's best strategy is casting a you know many partings in one and a woes pathfinder on two and then hoping to ramp into something right and that's like the antithesis of put yourself in the beatdown role. I mean, if things line up perfectly and, you know, maybe you're on the play and you play a Pathfinder, you play a 4-4 four, four on turn three, sure, you can do that. But if that gets disrupted, you have a really poor chance of being able to grasp that role. And like, so, so for a bigger issue here, like the green decks and what they're trying to do 
structurally as play this late game rampy deck generally that's what the, the green decks are doing it just doesn't line up that that falls into the camp of i'm trying to be defensive right and so you just inherently walk into problems there and then with the white cards for the most part the cheap ones anyways they're just like not that good at attacking most you know the two drops are uh x1 creatures they have one toughness right it's like the the rider the westfold rider the two mana three one and the took reaper uh, i guess there's the two two vigilance too but none of those two drops are particularly good at doing the I'm pressuring you very well. And they're not that good at the, oh, well, I'm stopping you from attacking. So I think aside from maybe just the rate on the red and the black cards being better than the rate on the green and the white cards, I think the green and white cards also just aren't doing themselves any favors on what they, you know, what they are trying to accomplish. And the other side of the coin here, where I was just suggesting, you know, really preserve your life total, you should be doing the opposite too. The other side of the coin here is you should lean towards getting in damage when you can, even if it means giving up a little bit of value or you know, kind of making a bad trade. So an example I have here, it's a game I was playing yesterday. My opponent's on a black-red deck, I'm on a blue-red deck. They're at 15, I'm at 19. They've got a 1-1 flyer, Dunlink Rebane, and a 4-4 uh, army token. I've got a 2-2 Battlescar Goblin, I've got a Bilbo, I've got three 1-1s, one and I've got a Moria Marauder. It's the, the double strike rare, 1-1 one -one double strike that whenever a goblin deals damage, you like flip the first, uh, top card of your library and you can cast that card this turn. So on face value, I've got six creatures to their two. If I attack all, I'm going to be losing my 2-2 two -two, because their 4-4 four -four is going to block uh, my 2-2. Two -two, and I'm dealing them a, a decent amount of damage, right? But usually in most formats, then being at 15 here, I'm not that likely to want to attack here. I'm like, okay, if they're at nine, I definitely make this attack. But then being at 15... Like, when you're trying to consider these situations, you're thinking, okay, if I just say, go attack all, attack all, attack all over three turns, am I going to get them dead? Well, I'm doing the math here, and no, I don't get them dead just doing that because they're going to be able, their 4-4 four four is going to be able to eat my 1-1s one over and over again, turn after turn. They're probably going to play another creature where my attacks are going to get worse. They're probably going to have an interaction spell. But in this format, I do believe that if I attack all, and they make some trades, they block 1-1, one one, Kribane blocks 1-1, one 2-2 one, two two gets eaten by... The, uh, the the army token, I deal them five points of damage here and I have a ring bearer going, I think that's worth it, right? So this might look like a situation to a lot of people where it's like, ah, oh, the 4-4 four four just blocks my 1-1s one and gets eaten. I think this is the kind of spot that you should be pressing your advantage. You should be getting that chip damage in. And this game played out kind of like I've been explaining, where it's just like my opponent felt like they were on the back foot. Yes, I was down a creature or two, but that's okay. And the other thing I actually didn't mention and people watching will might have noticed this, but people listening, obviously I didn't say this. But the orc token that they have, the 4-4 orc token, that was from, uh, part of it was from the Kribane, but part of it was from the Book of Mazerbul. They have a Book of Mazerbul. And Book of Mazerbul, the last chapter, the your creatures get plus one, plus zero, oh, and gain a uh, menace, they didn't attack me this game because I put them at that low life total. So it's a little bit of the, the best defense is uh, a good offense kind of uh, vibe with that going on too, where if you put your opponent on, on a lower life total, they are good aggressive cards that make them want to attack. Not just the ring, but stuff like Book of Miserable. Those get a little bit worse too. And then a little bit of an offshoot of this is just a kind of a, a mantra I've been having with this format is be proactive until you can't be. This is basically saying add to your board, spend your mana on proactive things before spending mana on reactive things, right? I was just talking about how it is kind of bad. You feel kind of like you're falling far behind. This was a mistake I was making where if you tried to react, react early, you start to fall behind in the late game. So what you should do instead is play out your creatures, play your two, play your three, play your four. You can cast your removal spells later. Your removal spells in this format are ideally being used to get in damage, not to just kill uh, you know, a threatening thing. Until your opponent plays something that's really threatening, you can't ignore it, right? Sometimes you just have to go, all right, I have to suck it up. I have to not affect the board this turn, or at least my side of the board. I have to answer their thing. That's fine, but it shouldn't be your go-to. Your go-to should be, Putting yourself in that driver's seat, trying to take that beatdown roll, and using your mana to try to further that plan. An example of this is, like I mentioned before, your opponent plays a March of the Black Eon turn two. You have to answer that. Your opponent plays a Frodo, the Green White Frodo. Uh, you, you guys have to answer that, right? You, you have to make sure they don't tempt again. You have to make sure that, you know, so especially if your only plays are X1 creatures, you have to cast your removal spell instead of play your X1 creatures because Frodo just eats them. So those are those are kind of the, the level of card I would need to see to be like, okay, I'm going to kill that rather than play my own creature first. Another concept that I want to touch on, and this is uh, one of the lessons that I had to learn after going back and looking at my gameplay and be like, oh, I, I was doing this wrong for so long in this format, is I think it's generally better to block later in the game 
rather than trying to block early. And that's a little bit strange, considering I was just talking about how it's important to preserve your life total early, not take too much chip damage, not get to down to that danger zone of 12, 11, 10 life. But here's how you kind of reconcile that. In most formats, let's just say, you know, you throw me into a game, uh, I don't really know the matchup, or maybe I do. Maybe let's just say it's a, I'm a red-black deck, my opponent's also a red-black deck. So we're, we're roughly around the same on the spectrum of beat down to control, right? And I'm on the draw, and my opponent's on the play. In most formats, if my opponent plays a 2-mana two 2-2 two -two on their turn, and they're on the play, I untap, I play my 2-mana two 2-2. Two -two. They attack me, I will generally block. This is because I'm on the draw, so I'm sort of supposed to take the control role in the matchup. Just, you know, my opponent is going to have a full mana more than me. They're going to be able to play better attackers, use their removal, you cast more things than I will be able to because I am one mana behind. And so what that means is, you want to stop your opponent from snowballing. And again, I've been talking about stopping your opponent from snowballing a lot today. And in most formats, that's a decent way of doing it. Just, just block their two drop. And this is especially true because often, you know, if your opponent's on the play, they'll play maybe a three mana three, three or a three, a three mana two, three. And your two, two doesn't really do anything. The reason in this format, I don't like making that exchange, blocking their two, two with my two, two is that by doing that, you give up the opportunity to be the beatdown role, right? Circling it back around to the, my first main point. If you trade off your two and they play a three, well, maybe your three is better. Maybe, maybe that's true. But a lot of the time, you're consigning yourself to that defensive role. And we already kind of covered the fact that that's not a good thing to do. So yes, they will have bigger and better things than you along the curve, just like in any other format. But that's okay because of the ring, right? That's that's the key. I get it. it. Keeps coming back to the ring because of the ring. That's okay because your cheap cards don't get outclassed like they would be in some other format. So it's okay to not make that trade, still try to race, still put yourself in that beatdown position even though you're on the draw. And to sort of reconcile that with the idea of oh, but you don't want to be taking chip damage. Yes, that's true. But in order of importance, it's try to take that beatdown roll. Don't take chip damage. Number one and number two, right? Uh, if you reverse those priorities, then you're gonna fall into some trouble. Now, this isn't going to apply to every single hand. Sometimes you do want to trade off with your two drop. You've got a really good four, really, really good five. I'm talking like, you know, great uncommon, great, uh, great rare level card. I'm not talking like commons here. But I do believe most of your games, if you just trade, don't trade off early and try to take that beat down roll still, even though you're on the draw, it pans out a little bit better for you on average. The other thing is blocking is punished in a lot of small other ways too. So for example, a card that is commonly played, Shalab's Ambush, single black mana for an instant, Target creature gets plus one, plus two, and gains death touch, and you make a food token. Your opponent's in the play, and they attack in. They have three mana. Two, two, on two, two. Once again, they cast Ambush and cast another two, two. You're so far behind in that game. You're so far behind. It's it's almost impossible to take the beatdown roll at that point, because not only do you have not, no, you have no board, they have a board, but they're also up three life, right, from the Ambush. So if you just don't block early, and don't let your opponent just get you with that card, you know, block later when you have an interaction spell up, or block later when you have your own trick up, that just puts you in such a better position. There's also a few cards that, you know, stuff like Denethor, Ruling Steward, or Faramir, the Uncommon Faramir, or uh, Smeagol. A, a decent amount of cards that, you know, I, I, my opponent will offer me a trade that looks pretty good on face value. I'm like, okay, like, that, that's a pretty good creature you're, you're offering me to trade when I'm, I'm trying to block here. Okay, I'll block it. And then they cast Denethor, and they made it 1-1. Or they cast Faramir, and they draw a card. And it's just, you know, time and time again, getting punished. Fear Fire Foes, that's another one where it's just like, okay, your opponent attacks their... 2-2 two, two into your 3-3, three, three, you're like, okay, I'll block, I'll see what's happening here, and you, they go, Fear Fire Foes, target your 4-4, four, four, kill that 3-3 three, three that was dealt damage, and kill your 1-1s one, too. Kind of a disaster. So, it's a lot of small things, small, like, cards, actual cards that punish you for blocking early, on top of the structural problems in this format with trying to trade off early and trying to take the control role. And then the last thought on blocking later, not early, is that, remember, I think I touched on this already, but remember, your cheap creatures, they don't get outclassed in this format the same way they would in other formats. So not only is that cheap creature that you didn't trade off on turn two, maybe that wears the ring later and you can start attacking, but also that cheap creature is going to be able to block your opponent's ring barriers. So those creatures still have value in the late game. It's not like, you know, some formats you're like, I, I just need to trade off my two because Man, this two drop's gonna get outclassed so, so quickly. That's not the case in this format. And then lastly, before we move into some individual cards, I wanna talk about playing with the ring, because this is the main set mechanic, and it's a really large contributor to how many decisions you have to make in the game. It is a decision-filled mechanic. And because it's such a complex mechanic, and it's gonna play a little bit differently game to game, I'm not gonna be able to give you a perfect overview of how to play it, but I, I did kinda wanna try to give 
a crash course in best practices when playing with and against the ring. So first of all, the first ability, your ring bearer is legendary and can't be blocked by creatures with greater power. Not too much of a decision there. Basically, you're gonna put it on the highest power creature that doesn't match your opponent's lowest power creature, right? So if you have a 1-3, you're gonna put it on that instead of your 2-2 two -two, if they also have a 2-2, two -two, but if they have three threes, you're gonna put it on your 2-2 two -two instead. Once you get to the second ability, it starts to matter a little bit more. That whenever the ring bearer attacks, draw a card, then discard a card. This ability, you need, you don't want to keep attacking as much as you can. And the heuristic you can use is you put your ring on your small creature if they don't have small creatures. And you put your ring on a bigger creature if they have small creatures. So, for example, if you've got a, you know, your opponent's board is just a 1-3. A it's Pelagru Survivor. The, uh, the blue 1-3 that adds mana. And you've got your own Pelagru Survivor. And then you cast a Relentless Rohirrim. Well... Generally, it's probably better to put the ring on the Relentless Rohirrim because that thing can keep attacking, right? I mean, the 1-3, that can attack into your opponent's 1-3 too. But in a lot of board states, they'll have like two 1-3s and a 1-1 one -one and you're, it just gets triple blocked and it dies. The 4-3 keeps getting in and in and in. Or at the very least, you know, if they want to block the 1-3 and a 1-1, one -one, they lose two creatures, right? So um, that's, a, that's a decent guideline you can use. Put it on the small thing unless they also have a small thing. Then you put it on the big thing. On the topic of looting, and looting could be its whole episode, honestly, because I think it is a, a kind of a complex topic and something that does give a lot of people trouble. Y you generally want to be able to plan your future turns to figure out what you want to discard. Like, I know a lot of people kind of have trouble giving them, they have this decision of, I got five cards in hand, what do I discard? I've just drawn this new card. How do I you have to reassess the board state? And it is tricky. It really is. I think a way to attempt to make the right decision is just kind of think of how your next few turns are going to play out. Do you need land number five? Maybe your hand's all cheap stuff. Maybe land number five doesn't help you double spell, but maybe it does, right? I think a lot of people's instincts are pitch land, pitch land, pitch land. But I think a big mistake I often see is people pitch a land when if they just kept that land, next turn they could double spell and they'd be way ahead. Where instead they have to single spell because they were like, oh, like, you know, lands are bad in the late game or in the mid game. Where if they just pitched an unimpactful spell, they could cast two impactful spells. So really just planning your future turns, or at least having some foresight, uh, really helps you make better looting decisions. Another thing related to looting is when to hold lands and when not to in the mid to late game. A lot of times I'll be on like six lands-ish, and I will have a land in hand and maybe another spell... And I will play the land a lot of the time. And some of you, know, when I'm streaming, people will be like, oh, don't you want to hold that for the, the ring? And maybe you don't have the ring bear going right now, but for potential uh, future tempting. And sometimes, yes. But sometimes, if just like I was talking about the, the previous scenario where you're like, oh, I, I can double spell on turn five. Sometimes I'm using all of my mana, right? Sometimes like you, you're able to activate an ability plus cast a spell. Or, you know, you're able to crack a food and do something else. If you've got a tangible onboard thing you can see you're going to use the mana for in a, you know, in a pretty reasonable time frame, then just play the land. Because you're whenever you're looting, yes, it's better to upgrade a land into a spell. But whenever you loot, it's always going to upgrade your draw and never downgrade it. So you're not losing it that much by playing your land. And, you know, lands, lands are cards, too. I think a lot of people are like don't see lands as cards. They see them as necessary evils <laughs> a lot of the time. But lands, they help you cast your spells and activate your abilities, like they say, you know? So don't don't automatically just go, okay, I'm going to hold this land, because sometimes that does hinder you. And then a note for the third ability on the ring here, whenever your ring bearer becomes blocked by a creature, that creature controller sacrifices it. When you have this ability, you then want to switch the heuristic I was talking about, where it's like you put it on your small thing, put the ring on the small thing, unless they they have a, a you know 1-3 of their own. That goes back to, well, I want to put it on the small thing, because now your 1-3 uh, can't really get blocked by your opponent's 1-3 without them also losing it. And just a small note, the ring in general, if you can, it's better to spread out your threats. So put the ring on something that your opponent isn't already going to want to kill. A good example is this, if you have a, a Dunline Crabane, right? The 1-1 one, one flyer is just kind of pecking in at your opponent. And that's a pretty good ring bear because it's very hard to block. But you've also got a 1-3, right? And your opponent's uh, got a 1-3 of their own. You might think, okay, well, Dunline Crabane, that thing's never going to get blocked. But your opponent's already probably going to want to answer their Crabane because it's, it's pecking and it's being annoying. So put it on the 1-3, so when they draw the removal spell, they have to choose between killing your Cobain and killing your Ring Bear. And then just some best practices for playing against the Ring. Generally, I will prioritize killing the Ring Bearer whenever I can. I guess more specifically, when I when they're at the second level of the Ring. Like, if I have a removal spell, a, a DL3, and say that situation I was just talking about, they have a Dunlane Cobain that is their Ring Bearer, I'll cast my Smite, my DL3 on it, just because them continuously looting, or even looting once, you know, you don't see it, it's invisible. But... 
the opponent looting once, getting rid of a card they don't need to finding a card they do need, that can be the difference in a game. So I, I do prioritize, like this is another example of when should you be reactive? Well, sometimes you can let them hit you a few times because, you know, victory is in sight and you're like, okay, I don't care if they loot a few times. I have a very clear path to victory. But if the game is going to go on another four or five turns, you should, you should take some time off affecting your board and kill the ring bearer. Like a level two, level three, level four ring bearer is essentially the equivalent of a March of the Black Gate or a Frodo, the kind of cards I was talking about earlier. And also just, you know, one thing that, you know, to prevent a, a silly mistake, this is only I did a lot, just, uh, you know, getting used to the format is don't forget about that third ability of the ring. I've blocked a lot of my one threes on their one threes when they have that ability. I'm like, oh wait, no, no, this is just a chump block. This is very bad. Uh, nothing too uh, strategic and interesting. Just a reminder, basically, because uh, that, that is something that has happened a lot to me. All right, and to close out here, let's talk about some individual cards, some thoughts around playing around them, and some, some of them are going to bring out some bigger picture concepts that we can talk about. So first one I want to talk about is Rohirrim Lancer. is the single red mana for the 1-1 one, one Menace, and when it dies, the ring tempts you. The thing I want to say about this card generally is I tend not to block it, actually. Uh, so this, this goes back to the order of priorities. It's important not to take chip damage, but... It's also pretty important not to give your opponent the ring. I, I think the way I would frame this is it's generally okay to take, you know, four or five points of damage for your opponent not getting to that second level of the ring ASAP. I mean, sometimes you look at your hand and you go, all right, I can actually draw, deal with ring bearers. I have high toughness blockers. I have, you know, a good amount of interaction spells. And you go, okay, I actually don't want to chip, take the chip damage, but more and more and more, uh, which is kind of counter to a lot of what I've said with Rohirrim Lancer specifically, I just don't block it a lot of the time. So this isn't to say you should never block Rohirrim Lancer. It's just to say that I think a lot of people's first instincts are, all right, just double block this thing, get it out of the way, stop it from dealing me damage. Especially if you're already beating down pretty well. You know, you don't, you don't have to really answer this uh, little 1-1 one, one pecking in at you. Next card is Gandalf, Friend of the Shire. is the four mana, three and a blue, two, four, flash, legendary creature, avatar, wizard, at uncommon. It says you can cast sorcery spells as though they have flash. I always forget about that line of text, honestly. And it says whenever the ring tempts you, if you choose a creature other than Gandalf, you draw a card. So the thing I want to talk about this card is the flash aspect of it and when you should block with it and when you shouldn't. So if my opponent attacks with a 2-2, two -two, let's just say that's the only creature, I'm only a 4 mana, I have Gandalf. Should I block? Well... It kind of depends on the game. How worried are you about your life total? Are you at 10 at this point of the game? Yeah, I'd probably just block at that point. Am I at 18? Well, being at 18 on turn four isn't that bad. So I'll probably just take it, then untap with Gandalf. If I have tempting cards in my hand, right? If, if I don't have tempting cards in my hand, I'm just like, all right, whatever. I block with Gandalf, try to eat your 2-2. Two -two, and, uh, you know, if, if you want to use a combat trick to finish it off, that's totally fine. I, I really don't mind that. If you have tempting cards in your hand, though, there's an opportunity cost, right? It's like, okay, well, this Gandalf could draw me three, four cards or something like that. So generally, just the heuristic to use here is block with Gandalf if your life total is, you know, in that kind of danger zone I've been talking about, 12 or below. And you don't really need to if uh, if you do feel like, all right, you're not under that much pressure and you've got a bunch of tempting cards in hand. For Ray of Orcs, this is the four and red uncommon sorcery. It's uh, a mass Orcs 2, and when you do... For Ray of Orcs deals X damage to target creature and opponent controls where X is the unmasked army's power. So I want to go into some rules stuff about this card, which is kind of funky because it's actually bugged on Arena right now. So I'm going to talk about the way it's supposed to function first. So when you cast this card, if your opponent removes the army with something like, you know, just instant speed kill spell, just, a, you know, a bitter downfall. Even if your opponent kills your Orc army, when the trigger goes in the stack, you will still deal the damage uh, referencing the last known power of the 4A. So, like, if you if you have 4-4 four, four army and your opponent kills it, it'll still deal 4. It doesn't actually function like that on Arena, and they haven't fixed that bug yet. I'm not sure why, but it, it does create that kind of trigger. There are some cards that can kind of get funky with this, though. Specifically, uh, Golem's Bite. So, if you have Golem's Bite, which is a single black mana, negative 2, negative 2... And your opponent has just like a 2-2. Two, two, you know, they don't have any other uh, armies before they cast this card. They just cast it as a 2 and making a 2-2. Two, two. You can Golem's Bite in response to the trigger, the deal damage trigger. And it actually won't deal damage. Because when the army dies, it will have zero power. Because uh, Golem's Bite gives it negative 2, negative 2. Same kind of thing happens with the Sieve the Messenger. The negative 3 blue trick. If you cast that... You can kind of foil your opponent's plans with the 4A of Orcs. Glorious Gale and Soriman's Trickery. So these are the, the counter spells. Glorious Gale being the one in a blue instant counter target creature spell. And the ring tempts you if that spell was legendary. Soriman's Trickery being the one blue blue instant counter target spell amass Orcs 1. So let's talk about Glorious Gale first. I like this card quite a bit. 
but it's a late game card. It's not a card that you're hoping to count on your opponent's two drop. Generally, once again, if you're holding up two mana, you're not affecting the board. You're not trying to gain that beatdown roll. It's a card for later. And generally, this is going to be better later than earlier, right? You get to counter a five or a six mana play instead of a two mana play. That's pretty good. Now, of course, you know, if you have nothing else to do, it's, it's fine. It's going to be, it's going to play the role of a two drop. But time and time again, I have held mana up. My opponent either didn't play something or they played, a, you know, a rally or a book of Mazerbull, just something, a creature that couldn't be countered by Glorious Gale. And you, you feel pretty darn bad about that, especially if you're playing in the higher ranks or against good players. People really do start to play around this. And, and sometimes people, I, I've, I've noted that people, even when they don't have like an alternative play, they could say, okay, like sometimes they go, I have a rally and I have a two drop. Well, I mean, rally's not the best example. You're always going to play the rally <laughs> generally because that's the best, uh, one of the better two drops. But let's just say they have a book of Mazerable and a Dunline Curbain. They're going to play the book a lot of the time because if you wanted to blue up, because it's like, okay, I get to play around that card pretty freely. But even if they don't have a card that plays around it, sometimes people just pass the turn. And that's a generally a good thing to do. You should just pass the turn if you've already got something on board because your opponent will just be wasting their mana. And a lot of times they will hold it up the next turn and be like, oh, okay, that's fine. And if they don't, they feel like they have to affect the board, then, you know, you get cast a creature after they tapped out. So the, the general guidelines for Glorious Scale playing with it, don't try to leave it up on turn two if you have another play. Play it later. That's that's great. because that, And also, you'll more, be more likely to get tempted by the ring later because a lot of the legends are more expensive. When playing against the blue deck, you know, try your best to play around it. I, I don't always recommend the just don't play anything line because sometimes your opponent has something to do at instant speed that they, they do get to use their mana and you kind of do get punished for that. But uh, if, if you maybe this is the best of three and you've seen most of your opponent's deck and you know they don't have a lot of that stuff, yeah, I think it's totally fine. If you're ahead on board, that's the thing. You don't want to just be like, okay, my first play of the game is a three drop, but I'm not going to play it because they have one, two and a blue up. You shouldn't do it then because then you're just playing into your opponent's plan of, you know, keeping the board clear, not, them not taking damage. If you've already got a two drop going, attacking them, pressuring them, they will feel pressured into tapping out or tapping down at least. And then you can kind of uh, cast your spell later. Sorman's Trickery is a bit trickier to play around. And uh, I think this one you should hold up on turn three if you can. Not only is it really good, like if you get something on turn three, they, they, they cast something, whatever it is, and you get an orc, you, you're just, you start to pull really far ahead in that game. It's just a really good deal. But unlike with Glorious Gale, you can't really get gotten, quote unquote, by this one, right? It's not going to be like, oh, they cast the book. You can still cast a uh, counter book of Miserable or a uh, rally or a uh, removal spell they cast. This one, part of the reason Sorman's Trickery is better than Glorious Gale is for that reason. It is catch-all. And uh, by the way, if you're not drafting Stormman's Trickery, highly, this, this is a very, very good card. This is not a, uh, not just a cancel variant with a bit of upside. This is like, you know, top five uncommons. This is, this is a great card. Gets around all, a lot of the problems that Glorious Scale has. Next up, we've got the cycle of land cyclers. And the question here is to cycle or not to cycle? And the answer to that generally depends on one, how many lands you have in your hand. And two, what you foresee your next few turns looking like. So if you've got like a three land hand and you've got like some twos, some threes, I generally won't cycle early because sometimes you're just going to draw three lands. You can cast your generous enter your troll at Chaos of Doom. But let's say you have three lands and a five drop. Well, you're probably going to want to cycle if you're, if you've already got your turn two, turn three, turn four spoken for you. Like if you're already going to be curving out and you don't have any time to spend that one mana, yeah, you should probably just cycle it on turn one. But I think more often than not, people make the mistake of always just cycling in your opening hand. Like I've had a lot of moments on stream where I've had people be like, oh, I, I definitely would have lost this game because I would have cycled my, you know, Lorien Revealed on turn one to try to hit a land because it's in my opening hand. I think a lot of people just cycle automatically if it's their opening hand. Well, you should weigh it. This is kind of like the looting issue again, where you, if you are good at planning out your turns, kind of good at figuring out what you're going to be doing on future turns, that better informs your decision if you should cycle or you shouldn't cycle. So to put a button on their cycler, should you cycle? Should you not cycle? It depends. <laughs> it's, it's really the answer. But the general guidelines are if you are land light and you know you're going to be spending mana on the early game, yeah, just cycle it. But, you know, you've got three, four lands and you, you can see there's a spot in your curve where you've got like, you know, you've got uh, two two drops. You're missing your uh, three drop and, you know, you're able to go two and then two and cycle on three if you then miss another land drop. Yeah, that's, that's totally okay. Next up, we've got Improvised Club. This is Tuna Red for an instant. Sacrifice a creature or an artifact in addition to casting the card, and it deals four to any target. Very quick note about this card. If you are setting up lethal with this card, or you think that part of your game plan will be four to the face eventually at some point, 
you want to do that as late as possible. So I've had situations when I'm on stream where my opponent will point a removal spell at one of my creatures, and I have an improvised club in hand, and, you know, somebody will be like, oh, don't you want to sack your creature in response to, to, to club them? And they're at, like, 12 still. And I go, no, I don't think so, because I, I can always sacrifice anything, right? I, no matter, I, I can always sacrifice uh, a, a token, a, a treasure token, a creature that has, you know, gone unblocked and after I go for lethal. But if you let them know that they you have a club, they're at 8, instead of, you know, thinking they're at 12, if you, if you alert them to the fact that they're actually at a lower life total than they actually thought they were, they're going to play a little bit differently, right? So them not knowing that DL4 is in your hand, that's a big deal because that means they might try to race. They might try to take that beat down roll where you have this hidden information that you have this deal for in hand. So try to keep, try to cast this as late as possible. Another kind of weird rules interaction that I want to bring up is War Beast of Gorgoroth. This is the four and red five, four common that when it, uh, let me read out the wording actually specific because it matters. Whenever War Beast of Gorgoroth or another creature you control with power four or greater dies, amass Oryx two. So you might think this kind of works like the foray of Oryx, like I was talking about, where you can, like, negative 2 it, and, uh, you know, the, if, if you negative 2, it won't be 4 power when it dies, and they won't amass 2. So it, it's, it's a weird disjointed wording in a way, and it makes sense if you once I say it, I think. But you can't, like, negative 3 deceive the messenger to make sure this doesn't amass 2. It says, whenever War Beast of Gorgroth, that's one part of it, or another creature you control with four power or greater dies, amass two. So when the war beast dies, it's always going to amass two. You can affect the other creatures. So say you wanted to golems bite a 4-4 a four, four in combat, shrink it. That won't amass. So just be careful about that, that distinction. And the last card I want to talk about here is a mythic Palantir of Orthanx. So this is the three mana legendary artifact that at the beginning of your end step, you put a influence counter on the Palantir. You scry two. And target opponent may have you draw a card. If that player doesn't, you mint looks cards, wrecks the number of influence counters on Palantir. Then your opponent loses life equal to the total mana value of the cards milled. The way you generally want to play against this card is the first time they play it, you know, they play on turn three, you want to take the damage. You're often not going to take that much. If they didn't mill anything that dealt you a lot of damage, you can maybe take it again. And maybe you know, as, as it keeps going, if you've taken more damage than the previous ones, you want to stop and you want to give them some cards. Uh, instead of taking the damage and eventually it'll be like, okay you're just going to keep drawing cards but i've had quite a few games where the way they've played out is you know that's happened I, I took damage took damage then let them draw cards for you know maybe three four turns maybe they had some other card draw in their deck and because they tend to scry lands to the bottom because that's what this card intensifies you to do both you generally don't want to draw the lands in the late game and you don't want your opponent to mill them because that won't deal them any damage your opponents, if this isn't a play for a while, your opponent's going to have a bunch of lands on the bottom of their library. So I've won games where the Palantir gets up to like, you know, eight counters or something. And maybe I'm at seven or six or, you know, somewhere in kind of a, a tough spot, kind of a, a low life total. But then I realize, oh, wait, I, it's pretty likely that all the cards on the bottom of their library are just lands. Now, this isn't guaranteed. I'm not saying that you should just always bank on them putting a bunch of lands on the bottom. Sometimes they, they won't do that. Sometimes you'll get uh, get kind of gotten by this. But just consider it as an option. The, the times I've done that are often in a game that I, I thought I wasn't going to win or I thought maybe my opponent had lethal the next turn and it was kind of like a last-ditch last effort. And uh, then after a few times playing against it, I was like, oh, this is actually a legitimate plan. So once again, this isn't a always never type situation. It's just something to be aware of. And that's it. Thank you so much for watching, for listening. These are always some of my favorite shows to do. Next week, we got a guest coming on. It's a fan favorite. You can probably guess who it is by me saying that even. So stay tuned for that. And if you listen this far, watch this far, once again, consider checking out the Patreon, patreon.com slash limitedleveleups. All right. Bye, everybody. See you later.